Thou shalt not steal. That's the message of this morning. And I know many of you are thinking right now, I got up on this October morning to come hear a message to tell me not to take other people's stuff. Yes, you did. (laughs) Yes, you did. Here at Peace Church, we are in the midst of a sermon series on the Ten Commandments. And today we find ourselves at the Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal. I know there's part of me that just wants to say, don't take other people's stuff. Okay, let's go to brunch. But as we're going to see today, there is, there's a lot more to this than just not taking other people's property. So with that, let me say good morning to you. My name is Pastor Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at Peace Church. Good morning to those of you down in our venue and those of us who are joining us online. I'm excited to continue. And as we near the end of this sermon series on the Ten Commandments, we've been talking about real love. How the Ten Commandments aren't just our guidelines for being good citizens. The Ten Commandments are how we demonstrate love in this world. Love of God and love of others. So again, we are at the Eighth Commandment today. That's Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. If you go ahead, you can turn there now. It's short and sweet. It's on page 78 in the Bibles and the racks that are around you. And I know that of all the sermons... From all the Ten Commandments, I know that this is the one you've been waiting for. (laughs) Don't steal. Don't take other people's stuff. Let's get to it. A short commandment. But what it communicates to our hearts is going to be so much more than what these four little words will give at face value. You shall not steal. Would you all say this with me? Here we go. You shall not steal. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we need you by the power of your Holy Spirit to illuminate this text for us. We know there is more here than simply don't take what's not yours. So God, we need you to speak through your word. Do not let us off easy today, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. So as with every sermon in this sermon series, this is the outline. If you're a note taker, this is where we're going to be going. The commandment, we're going to take a moment and just look at this commandment. Then we're going to look at conviction. We're going to look at how this commandment affects our heart. And then we're going to look at calling. How do we live out a statement like do not steal? So let's start with this, the commandment. So I I have four children. Twelve, six, um, twelve... I have four children, (laughs) and I can tell you this. With each one of them, my wife and I, we worked really hard to make sure that their first word, I wanted to make sure the first word was dada. She wanted to make sure the first word was mama. She won some. I almost won others. (laughs) But we worked really hard, and we worked for a year. I mean, the moment they were born... We're like, dada, dada, say dada. Of course, my wife was like, say mama, say mama. For a year, roughly, you know, we worked, for a year we worked really hard for this very first word. Mama would pop out. Very soon after, I would continue working. Dada would pop out. And then all of a sudden, words started coming out that we didn't work towards. Do you know what the third word was? I hate a little debate going on. It was no. No, thus showing they were telling us no. So kids, they break the fifth commandment first, which is honor your father and mother. This, the next one, the fourth word was mine. Where did they get this? Not mine as in I own that thing, but mine as in I want that thing. And I want to take it. And I want to have it. See, we are born natural thieves. Being a parent showed me that, and I'll be honest, being in ministry showed me that this natural bent to have what is not ours, and I dare say what is someone else's, that doesn't go away. Nearly 90% of people, almost 90% of people would say that they have kept this commandment, do not steal. But have we truly kept this commandment? Have we truly kept this law? The Westminster Catechism, Westminster Catechism, 
uh, a document written around the 1600s. It's one of our statements of faith here at Peace Church. It helps us to explain, it helps to explain this commandment a little bit more. It takes this four-word command and it gives us a 300-plus word description. I'm not going to read it for you, but let me summarize the spirit of the answer. And I really think it does hit the heart of this commandment. We are required to be completely truthful, just, and fair in everything we do to and with our neighbors, meaning the world at large. It continues. We are prohibited from selfish gain, which exploits people, as well as the greedy misuse of the systems in place. And I think for some of us, even right now, in the darkness of our hearts, even now we're trying to defend our actions with some of the ways that maybe we've dealt with people or abused the systems in place. We say this by saying, how truthful is truthful? What do you mean by the misuse of the system? The eighth commandment. See, people ask these things, and Christians are no exception, but this is what people try to do. Again, Christians, we do the same thing. We try to follow the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. Let me give you an example. My son, Will, uh, when he was getting to the age where we were trying to show him how to dress himself, I would take his pants and I'd say, okay, buddy, here's, here's what we're going to try and do. We're going to take these pants and we want to get these on you. We want to teach you to put your pants on. So I would, you know, open up the trousers, put it before him. I would say, okay, bud, put your leg in. He would grab my shoulder and he would do this. <laughs> Pants come out of my hand, flop on the ground. I look up at him like, come on, dude. You know what we're trying to do here. And he looks at me like, I did what you told me to do. You told me to put my leg in, so I put my leg in. I'm like, he did what I said but not what I meant. Don't we do the exact same thing? We try to, this. I did what you said, not what we meant. Just like when kids take things that's not theirs, and we say, give it back, what do they do? They throw it. They throw it at their brother or sister. They did what we said, but not what we meant. We do this with God's law all the time. I did exactly what God said to do. But did you do what God meant for you to do? And we think because we have never shoplifted or because we've never broken into our neighbor's house to steal their flat screen, that we've somehow kept the eighth commandment. Listen, this commandment is truly and fully lived out when our neighbors, when the world around us, when they feel loved by us in regards to how we interact with them through transactions and through the respect of their personal property, when they feel loved, when they feel loved by us, when we cheat or shortchange people, when we treat them unfairly, when we leave people feeling unloved by our actions, even if they are legal and even if they agree to them, if they walk away feeling unloved, We have not kept this commandment, but we have broken it. And my friends, we have placed ourselves within God's judgment. His standard is much higher for you than simply do not steal. That is the base approach to how you are to love those around you. And so this can't just be a commandment we follow. It needs to be a conviction of our heart. I remember this one time. uh, I was at a gas station, and I went in to pay for, for the gas, and I put my phone on the counter, and I got my wallet out, and I paid for, the, paid for my gas, and I walked away, and I left my cell phone on the counter. Didn't realize it till I got home. I got home, and I'm like, oh, where's my phone? I'm thinking, what did I do with it? I look in the car, and then I realize, oh, I left it at the gas station. So using our home phone, back when we still had those things, I called the gas station, and I said, hey, by chance, is there a cell phone there on the counter? The gal there is like, mm, I don't see anything. Nope, sorry, I don't see anything. Nothing was given to us. I'm thinking, oh, dang it. Then I was like, oh, okay. I'll call the phone. So I call the phone. I call my own cell phone. And this guy answers like it's just a peach of a day. Hello? 
oh, hey, uh, you must have just been at the Shell gas station. That, this is my phone. I just left it there. He said, yeah, I found it. I said, oh, great. Hey, you, you, you can't be far. Can I meet you somewhere and get it back? Nope. What do you mean, nope? Dude, you were just there. I mean, I can come right back. I can just meet you right where it's at. Sorry, man. It's my phone now. And then I said this. Dude, don't be a reason the world is terrible. And then he says this to me, and this is no joke. This is what he said to me. The world is terrible. Thanks for the phone. Those words are forever etched into the anger of my heart. <laughs> but those words are forever etched into my heart. The world is terrible. This dude told me this on my own cell phone. The world is terrible. Thanks for the phone. While I was infuriated at the time, in time, my heart breaks for this guy. My heart breaks for this guy because here's what he did. He let the world set the bar for him. And that's all he felt he had to rise to. Question. Where have you done the same? Where in your life have you done the same? Where in your life have you let the world set the bar and that's all you feel you need to rise to? Downloaded a song illegally or a movie? I mean, I could go on and on. Anytime we say, well, everybody does this, and we use that as an excuse to steal or to cheat, however small of amount, we are basically saying, the world is terrible, thanks for the phone, and we're no better than that guy. Because we just let the world set the bar for us. The world is terrible, thanks for the phone. This isn't about becoming moral purists. Listen to me. This is about becoming truly Honest people. Honest when the government is looking. Honest when the church is looking. Honest when other people are looking. And honest when no one is looking. One of the names for the devil is the thief. Jesus says the thief, Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. When we steal... Or when we have dishonest gain, listen to me, you are playing the part of the devil. And that is not befitting for the people of God. We are, we are a culture of consumption, aren't we? We are a consumeristic culture. We want stuff. And not only do we want stuff, but as soon as someone has something better than us, we want that stuff. And it's not always the most honest path to achieve it. I think most people in our society, and I say around here, most people in our society that maybe come and go through the, the doors of Peace Church, most people in our society, we steal not because we have need, but because we have want. Because we have want. But in fact, the Bible does not con condone, but is understanding to those who steal out of hunger. It calls us to be compassionate, but listen to what it says. Do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry. But it goes on. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. See, the Bible says have compassion and be, don't despise someone if they steal because they're hungry. But that doesn't give them right to go outside the laws of a just society. They still will have to adhere to the laws of justice, but we don't despise them. But us, but for us, people of plenty, when we are unjust in our business, when we are cheating in our transactions, when we fudge the numbers to go in our favor, there is no excuse for that. In fact, there will be judgment for it. The world is terrible. Thanks for the phone. Don't be that guy. Here's one for you. The next time you're at a restaurant, add a dollar or two to the tip. I promise you, you won't go broke. But you're doing it right now. I'm willing to bet you're doing it right now. You're, you're trying to figure out, how can I follow the letter of the law? 
not the spirit of the law. When I told you to add a dollar or two to the tip, here's what you just did. But what if it was poor service? But what if it was bad food? But what if I already tipped 15%? What if I already obeyed the letter of the law? The spirit of the law is for that person to feel loved in your transaction by them. The reality is, the reality is that the fact that we are Christians should always trump the fact that we are customers. I see some glazing over and maybe some darts want to be thrown at me, so let me just go ahead and rephrase that for you. The fact that you are a Christian should always trump the fact that you are a customer. When someone walks away from you, they should think, I felt loved by that person. But we, we want to defend our American rights. As a customer, I get this X, Y, and Z. And if I don't get X, Y, and Z, then I get a right to complain about it. I'm sorry, my friends. The stakes are way too high. We need to be Christians first and always, showing a love for others that God has given to us, that when we don't deserve love, God still gives it to us, that when they don't deserve love, we still give it to them. This is a call of more than just don't steal. This is a call to love. The letter of the law is do not steal, to act justly. But that points to the spirit of the law, which is for people to feel loved by all their dealings with us. This should be the conviction of our hearts, but it should also be the calling of our lives. The calling of our lives. I know this is a a prohibition commandment. Do not steal. But the calling is a proactive one. So imagine my oldest my oldest child is Kennedy. She's got three younger siblings. Imagine I gave Kennedy four cookies. I said, one cookie is for you, and the other three are for your siblings. Now, imagine that Kennedy takes those four cookies and says, mine. And she doesn't give the three cookies to her siblings. Well, yes, she would be dishonoring to me and disobeying me. But in a sense... She's also stealing from her brothers and sisters. God has given all of us an amount of time, an amount of resources, an amount of opportunity. God has given us money. All that has been given to us, not just for our enjoyment and not just for our flourishing, but for his glory and, listen to me, and for the blessing of others. And so in the spirit of this commandment, I think that we can steal from people by not using what God has given us for their good. Paul writes in Ephesians, and he's talking to Christians who have been, he's talking to people who have become Christians who have been made new in Christ. And listen to what he says. He says, let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let's, let's check that again. Let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he can prove himself to be a man, so that he can prove himself to be a hardworking American, so that he can earn his keep. No. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. The letter of the Eighth Commandment is do not take what's not yours. But the spirit of the commandment is share what is yours. Through this series, we've talked about how the first four of the Ten Commandments are really about us loving God. And and then we've talked about how the last six, of which we are in right now, is about loving others. Love God, love others. But I think that in this commandment, there is a notion of loving God that we can't ignore. Loving God. If someone stole a thousand dollars from you, I'm willing to bet you'd be kind of upset by that. But what if the person said to you, But I don't agree with how you use that money. I could use it in better ways. Does that justify it for you? 
No, of course not. I know, that'd be silly. It's our money. No, it's our money. We get to do with it what we want. When someone steals from you and says, well, I would do a better job with it than you were, that doesn't satisfy us. That doesn't justify us. But how many Christians do the exact same thing with God's money? Now, I know I'm going into, you know, thin ice territory here. So let me just take a moment. I want to tell you about my neighbor, my old neighbor from my old house. At my last house, not longer, not long after I moved in, I'm out mowing the lawn. And I look over and this guy comes out of his house and he's walking over. He's got a couple drinks in his hand, and he waves me down and says, you know, stop your lawnmower, and hands me a drink. Says, obviously, he wants to get to know his new neighbor. Awesome. This guy had long, jet black hair. But it was, a, it, was a, it was an interesting contrast, this long, shiny, jet black hair against his very rugged, rough life face. But with a kind spirit and a spirit of hospitality, he gives me a drink, says, hey, let's, let's talk. And I notice there's this guy. He's, his, his, he's got a black T-shirt cut off. He's got a big cross on his arm, big cross tattoo on his arm, big gold chain with a big cross on his chain. And I noticed even the, the T-shirt had like some like rock and roll looking type cross on it. And I noticed, man, he's got, this guy's got lots of crosses and I looked at him and I said, man, I see all these crosses on you. Are you a Christian? He says, oh, me? No, no, I'm not a Christian. I said, what's all the crosses? He says, oh, I just think they're cool. I said, okay. I said, hey, you ever been to church? He says, yeah, you know, I went one time to church. I was like, yeah, what was it like? He said, yeah, no, I'm not going to go back. I said, what happened? He said, I went to church this one time and I sat there and the guy up on the stage, he tells me, listen to this, he, he tells me, I need to give him 5% of my paycheck. 5%, man, can you believe that? And I'm thinking, dude, I tell people 10%, but. <laughs> and he says this, he's like, I'm not going to give him my time if all he wants is my money. Now, hear me. Nobody wants your money. At least nobody on staff, nobody in our leadership. We're not sitting here, we want your money. We want faithfulness from our people. And faithfulness with our money is one of the ways that we truly live into this Christian life. As a pastor, I quickly tried to undo the damage, but that wasn't going to happen in one conversation. But I always remember the lesson from him. So I want you to hear me, especially if you're not a Christian or maybe you're new to Peace Church. There isn't much that reveals a person's heart like talking about money. Because the reality is money is a spiritual issue. It's not just about finances. It's about faith, faithfulness. But this is nothing new. This is nothing new for us. This is nothing new to God. God's been dealing with this issue among his people forever. The Old Testament book of Malachi reveals that God's people have become half-hearted in their devotion to him. If you read the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, it's easy to see that people are just getting lazy in their faith. And they're turning away from God's commands. And let me read to you what God says to his people. Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, we'll start at verse 5. God says, I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the uh, adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who who oppress the hired workers in his wages against those who oppress the widow and the fatherless, against those who deprive the former foreigners among you of justice. But listen to what God says. Even in the midst of judgment, God gives hope. He says, I will deal swiftly with those who are of injustice, but then this is what God says. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and, not ha and, and have not kept my law. But this is what God says. But return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you, but we say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? 
yet you are robbing me. But we say, God, how have we robbed you? And God answers, in your tithes and your contributions. The people were not being faithful to God, and yet he calls them to return to himself. The loving father looks at his people who have gone astray, and he says, return to me. And in this passage, the first way that God calls them to return to him is to be faithful in their tithes, to be faithful with their money. Why? Because this is a spiritual issue of faith and trust. God is saying to his people, if we are not tithing, then we are robbing from him. God is very clear in Leviticus 27. The tithe is not ours. It is God's. Meaning a portion of what God has given to you, he has given to you so that you can demonstrate a faithfulness in giving it back to him. This is why taking up an offering is part of our worship service, because it is an act of worship. Some of you will say, I give, just not to the church. Here's the reality. Some of us are too concerned with feeling good about our money rather than feeling faithful with it. For God, giving to him in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is always given among the local gathering of believers in an act of worship, whether that is the Old Testament temple or the New Testament church. Relatively speaking, our church is in in a healthy financial position. I'm not taking this and going here because I'm, I'm, I'm scared about where we are financially. We, we're in a healthy spot. We are in a healthy financial spot, and this is a product of the accountability by our leaders, proper stewardship of our staff, the faithful giving of our congregation, bless you, but it is always because of the blessings of God. The question is not, does the church have enough money? The question is, am I being faithful with money? A fully funded church is not a church that meets budget. A fully funded church is a church where 100% of its people are giving faithfully. So if you are part of the Peace Church family and you are not giving to the mission of God at your own church, then the question is, what reason do I have to keep God's money from him? Some of you will ask, well, do I have to give 10%? You can totally give more. I always say 10% is a great place to start, and it's certainly the standard that God sets in the Old Testament. But the New Testament answer to that question is, however much you've decided in your heart to give. A sanctified soul, looking at the breadth of the goodness of God as revealed in Scripture, looking at what this church is called to do, how can we not give at least 10%? I mean, what, what greater thing is there to give to than the mission of God? If you're a single mom with two hungry boys, then give what you can as long as it's from the heart. Even $5. Because I don't want you to miss out on the blessing of giving to God. Giving is not a burden. It is a blessing. And I don't want anyone to miss out on that blessing. So if you are that single mom, give $5 a week and let the church buy your groceries for the rest of the week. For me and for my family, the first 10% goes to God through the church, because we believe that's the biblical pattern. We certainly give on top of that to various ministries and charities that we think are great and that we want to support, but we will not rob from God by taking from his church to support another organization. No matter how wonderful it is, no matter how passionate we are about it, because there is no replacing the church. And I want to make sure that I'm doing my part to make sure that the church is fully funded first because I don't want to be caught robbing from God. And Malachi, when God, calls out his pe- when God calls out his people's lack of faith and when he calls them to return to himself, the first way he does that is by telling them, fulfill the eighth commandment, do not steal from me. I'm not concerned if you're a big giver. I want you to be a faithful giver. Again, Jesus says in John 10.10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But listen to what Jesus goes on to say. He says, but I have come 
that they may have life and have it to the full. Nearly 90% of us say that we have not broken this commandment. Then nearly 90% of us are wrong. We have all broken this commandment. In fact, we've broken all of the commandments, but not Christ. Christ fulfilled all of the commandments. See, where the devil wants to steal and wants to see you steal, Jesus wants to save and see you saved. In our hearts, we are children crying mine for that which is not ours because we are not satisfied with what we have been given. Yet even in that ingratitude, God looks at us, people who have given ourselves to greed, people who are trapped in the clutches of the devil, and God cries out, mine. And when we place our trust in Christ, listen to what the Bible says. Colossians 1 says that he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And we cannot be taken from that. We cannot be stolen away from that. Jesus goes on to say later on in John chapter 10, he says, I, have, I, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will harpizo them out of my hand. Harpizo means to seize, to snatch, or to obtain by robbery. We can't be stolen away from God once we are in his hands. The devil may be a thief, but he cannot take us from Christ. Our violation of the Eighth Commandment comes from not just disobeying the letter of the law, but from not fulfilling the spirit of the law. And because we haven't done that, that should bring us into God's holy judgment. But we, who have placed our trust in Christ, we have been saved by grace through our faith in Christ, through his death on the cross, that we would not face that judgment. Even when we steal from God himself, we would not face that, judge, that judgment. And because we have been redeemed people, we are called now to walk in true justice, respecting other people's stuff, loving what's fair, and giving to bless others with a generous and a faithful heart, always being thankful for all that God has given us in Christ because we can never outgive God. Friday morning, this past Friday morning, I was at the dollar store with my youngest daughter, Georgia, who was two. And we walked in, got a couple things I'm at the counter, and because I don't, she's a two-year-old, I don't want her running away, I put her in front of me, and I'm paying the person, get my bag, and we walk out and walk out to the car, open the door, put her in her car seat, buckle her car seat, and then I realize she's got something in her hand. One of those things. Now, I will have you know, those are a weak spot for me. I love those things. If you ever want to bless me, just stop on by the office. Give me a couple of those. You'll make my day. I look at her and I'm like, you little thief. And then I realized, well, I didn't steal it. She'll choke on it. And as I'm about to unwrap this thing, the Holy Spirit speaks right into my heart and says, what sermon are you preaching again on Sunday? <laughs> this is my life. I can't even give it away from stealing a 33-cent piece of chocolate. Cut right to the heart. Ugh, I have to unbuckle her, get her out, walk back in. The cashier's in the back. She hears the door ring. She comes out. I said, I'm sorry. My daughter took this, and I throw it back in a little basket. And she looks at me, and she's like, wow. How many people wouldn't have brought that back? I said, yeah, well, God's been good to me. I can't take it. She said, that's amazing. Thou shalt not steal. Christians, the Eighth Commandment calls us to demonstrate an honesty that people admire a generosity that people take notice of, and to demonstrate a heart that this world is missing. And we do this for the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you've been so faithful to us. Help us to be faithful to you. 
You are so loving to us. Help us to be filled with the Spirit, that we may fulfill the Spirit of this commandment, so that our neighbors and the world around us would see something truly different in us. And Lord, we can take that and point to your beloved Son. Help us to love with the love that you've given to us. Lord, we repent where we've stolen from our neighbors, where we have robbed from you. Turn our souls around to be oriented, to be, to, to be in accordance with your commands, that we would be people of love as we love our neighbors. Thank you, God, that in Christ we cannot be taken from you. Lord, we love you and we thank you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen.